There are two solstices each year. They occur around 21st of December and the 21st of June. And depending upon whether you're in the southern or northern hemisphere, these dates represent the longest or shortest days. So in the northern hemisphere on December the 21st, that part of the globe receives the least amount of energy from the sun on that day. However, whilst the days around the 21st of December can be cold, the days in January and February are often far colder than those of late December. And the reason for this is something called seasonal lag. So what is seasonal lag? How does it happen? More importantly, why does it happen? Well, the obvious thing, the major source of energy for the Earth is the sun. That energy then goes into heating up the land, the air, and most importantly the water on the surface of the Earth. Just like when you turn the heating on in a very cold room. Even though the heat source is pumping out a lot of heat, it has to heat up all the objects in the room and the air in the room before the room does feel truly warm. Then turn off the heating, the room starts to cool again as energy is lost through the walls, floor and roof. Of course, with windows open, the heat is lost even quicker. Similar things happening to the earth at night. The heat being gained from the sun being lost during the night, with more heat being lost on a cloudless night, just as if a window was open. However, not everything heats up or cools down at the same speed, and some things can take an awful lot of energy to get warm, as others require only a small amount. There are several factors which affect this warming rate. The first one is density. For instance, the ground is far denser than the air. So for the same volume, it require far more energy to heat the ground to warm the air. Conversely, the ground will give off more energy when the surroundings are cooler. Then there are the chemicals that the substance is actually made from. Some elements or compounds require more energy to heat up than others. It's known as the specific heat capacity. You can use this to compare the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of two different substances. And when you compare these two factors, two major substances in our environment which are opposite ends of this spectrum. These are air and water. So for the same volume of each, you need around 10,000 times more energy to raise the temperature of water than you would for air. Which means that during the day, the sun heats up the air far faster than it does the water, the seas and oceans. However, conversely, it also means that at night, the air cools far quicker than the water does, and the oceans can act as a vast heat sink slowly giving back some of the energy they gain during the day, keeping the area around the oceans fairly warm as a result. There's also a third factor here, affecting how the energy from the sun is transferred, that is motion. The molecules in the air and the seas are in constant motion, and the energy can fairly regularly pass from one part to another. Our land, of course, isn't in motion. This means that during a normal cycle, of day to night and back again, go deeper than about two metres, the Earth remains virtually at the same temperature, whether it's day or night. That depth of the Earth does change slowly in temperature over the year, but it's not within the change from day to night. However, even at a depth of about 10 metres, even the change in season doesn't alter the temperature down that deep in the soil. So whilst the soil may to some degree act as a store of the sun's energy, absorbing some of the energy during the day, returning it at night, the seas and oceans are a far more significant factor in the storing of the energy from the sun, especially when you factor in how much of the surface of the earth is actually covered in water. However, because there's so much water in the oceans, it has a high specific heat capacity, requires a massive amount of energy from the sun to increase the temperatures of the oceans. Far more energy, in fact, can be just produced by a couple of sunny summer days. Especially as you consider that during the night the oceans are cooling down again to return some of the heat they've gained during the day. This means it's a time lag between the peak of the long summer days and the oceans getting significantly warmer. It's only in July and August that the oceans are at their warmest. As a result of this peak, summer temperatures for those areas bathed in warm water also lags a few weeks behind the appearance of the summer solstice. It also means that the reverse is also true. At the start of the winter, the surrounding ocean is still fairly warm. It's only after an extended period of long, cold winter nights that the energy stored in the oceans is exhausted, again meaning a significant lag between the shortest day and the coldest day. The major reason 
the seasonal lag is the heat sink provided by the oceans, which also to some extent evens out the extremes of temperatures between the days and nights, as well as the season. Without the oceans, this planet would be considerably more hostile than we have at the moment.